The scripture reading this morning is from 1 John 5, verses 13 through 17. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. Thank you for reading that scripture. That was some really good news. I don't know if you followed it closely, but it doesn't get any better than that reading right there. Get your Bibles out and let's say this together, all right? This is my Bible. It contains God's will for my life. I can become what it says I can become. Today, I will study from his word. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never again be the same. I praise God and I hope that's always true every day day. We left off last time, a couple weeks ago, with this kind of the main thought. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Hang on to that faith. You won't be perfect, but you will be victorious. Today's text, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know <clears throat> that you have eternal life. There are two words in the Greek that are translated know. The first one is the word gnosko, and it just means to know things in general. But the second word, hiditi, is a deeper kind of love, and it's the kind that John uses here when he says, I want you to believe, those of you who believe in the Son of God may know that you have eternal life. I'll try to illustrate the two. <clears throat> I, Gnosko, I know a little bit about Abraham Lincoln. I read a few things, I studied a few things, but I've really, there's volumes and volumes of information that's been, re been read on him. I can't say I aditi him. I just know him in general. Aditi comes when God's revelation has become an absolute confident part of my life and I am putting my full spiritual weight down on that. John uses it three times in this chapter. I write these things to you who believe. Believe what? Believe what? Believe that your faith is what will position you and prepare you and enable you to have a relationship with God. It is faith that is victorious over the world. Believe in the name of the Son of God is to believe this. It's to believe that Jesus was God. Jesus came in the flesh. He was God in the flesh. And also that Jesus came to save us. And in fact, he has done just that. Do you, <clears throat> do you believe you're saved? I think there's a barrier here. Do you believe that you're saved? Yes. Thank you. I hate to have to ask for that, but somebody says, well, there's a difference between lost and saved. I'm saved. Woohoo! I'm lost. It's like, that's silence. You are, you are never, I know this isn't good grammar, but you are never more saveder than you are right now. When you came up out of the baptistry, you were saved. Now, hopefully, you're more mature and you're more useful to God in the kingdom, but you are never more saved than you are right now if you're faithful to God. Not, perfect, not perfection, faithfulness. Verse 14, this is 
Look at that. This is the confidence. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. <clears throat> Is your prayer life intensified by the fact that you know that you have eternal life? Does it make any difference? Is your prayer life greater because you believe you have a relationship with Jesus? I mean, you can stop at the moment's notice or when things are about to fall apart in your life and you can talk to the creator of the universe who says, I want to hear from you. I hope the fact that we know that we're children of God will, will help us in our prayer life to believe I can talk to God and God hears me. Not only are we confident in asking, but there's confidence in the hearing. It's real important. I, I, want, I want you to stay with me here for a few minutes. I, I'm not, it's not going to get tedious. I'm not going to wait out in the weeds yet anyway. But I want us to understand confidence. Dear friends, he said back in chapter 3, I write, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. So this isn't the first time we've heard that we have confidence and that God hears us. He just spells it out a little more in, in chapter 5. John's anything in chapter 3 and anything in verse 14 should challenge our prayer life. The phrase, according to his will, church, is not intended to discourage us from prayer. Does the fact that we pray, we pray and we say, God... We want what we ask, but we want it according to your will. Does that cause us to second guess God? That do we hope we, you know, we fall in one of those slots that God has authorized? And I'm praying, whew, I got it in here. If that's how we think, then maybe it suggests that what praying is a waste of time. When you, when you pray most, I, I know you can't speak up in here because the walls would fall down, but you pray most what? When you're in need, right? And we, we think of God often, but when I need something, I really think of God. But even at that moment, do I believe that he hears me? Think about this. What was Jesus' prayer? I don't want to die. You know, he says, let this cup pass from me. People think, oh, you're missing your cup of coffee. Forget it. He says, I don't want to die. Think about it. Was he afraid of where he was going when Jesus died? Was he afraid that when he breathes his last, he doesn't know where he's going? Jesus wasn't afraid of that. Listen to me. Jesus didn't want to be nailed to a cross and suffocate to death on the cross. Is there anything wrong with that? The body wants to live. Does your body want to live? Do you want your body to live? Yes. And there's nothing wrong with that. And Jesus knew exactly where he was going. He knew exactly what was happening. And he had planned it all from the beginning. But he says, I don't want to die. <clears throat> Is it possible that Jesus knows something that we don't know. No, no, let me do it this way. Was Jesus comfortable with God's will in his life? You think that makes a difference? Sure it does. See, well, no weeds. If God asks us to grant uh, uh, something according to his will, it does what? What does that do? That helps us from saying, well, I need this, Lord. I'm, I'm selfish stuff. Let me use an illustration. It's really wonky, but you'll get the point. A famous preacher was standing in front of the congregation. And he stood up and he said, I had a dream last night, and God said he wanted me, you to buy me a Cadillac. So I want you to dig down deep, come up with the quiet money, and I want you to buy me that Cadillac. Some deacon stood up and said, yeah, right after that, God had a, gave me a vision and said, cancel it. You see, we get really, we can get really crazy 
So when we say, God, I, I want this, maybe I don't even need it. I, every time I read the events of Jesus in the garden, I'm convinced that his feelings that he had were the most urgent feelings that a person on the face of the earth could feel. He, he, does he know he has to die? Does he know he needs to die? Yes. And so he surrenders his will. We don't like to surrender. I've had people tell me before, not many, I, I one or two people in my life have said, I don't have surgery because I don't lose control. Really? So you don't want them to cut that growth out. You're just going to deal with it, right? If we can learn to be comfortable with God's will in our lives, I think our prayers will take on a totally different direction and purpose, and we will have a different understanding. He says, if we ask for something and we, or I'm saying, if we ask for something, we believe that God would bless our lives and he gives it to us, we should say what? Thank you. If we ask for something that we think blesses our life and God doesn't give it to us, what should we say? Thank you. If we have that attitude, the one that Jesus had, that God, I really don't want this. I really believe we can be assured that every time we pray, we get an answer. Have you always thought that? Do you believe it? You really, I mean, are you going to just put your full weight down on it? Because it makes a difference. Are we satisfied with waiting, <laughs> wanting only what God wants for us? I'm confessing to you that's hard. It's not that I know what's best. I just want what I want. Did God hear Jesus' prayer? What did he say three times? In, in today's language, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. <clears throat> and as he was praying, what was dripping off of him? Sweat like drops of blood. Pretty intense praying, right? Could God have saved him? Stay with me. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Hmm. All right, back to our text in verse 14. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When we say he hears us, that's a confirmation that both our prayers are heard and answered. You think Jesus thought his prayer was answered? Yes. Because as much as he did not want to die, as much as he wanted to live with ever, why did, why did God want to live? Because he's in the flesh. Jesus doesn't want to die. Verse 15, if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. John's if here assumes that as true as it is, God hears our prayers. And it, it, let's, let's substitute since. For since we know that he hears us, that might help us a little bit. As surely as we know, Editi, that God hears us, we, Editi, that we have the request from him. Again, it's that deeper kind of knowledge. It's not surface. Yeah, I know there's a God somewhere, and I know there's all kinds of false gods. This is a God that says, I know that he hears me, and I know that I get the answer from him that I want if I submit myself to his will. Remember, he who asks 
is the one who receives. In this text, stay with me. Verse 16, and if, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that doesn't lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying he should pray about that. John is still discussing prayer. He hasn't lost it because he says he should pray or not pray. It seems to me that in this particular text, he's giving it, maybe it's a pivotal moment of an example of what it would be. God would want this and God would not want this. John's discussion of prayer and the sin unto and not unto death should cause us to what? I don't want to wait out. I'm, I don't want to wait out weeds. You know, I didn't. I, I guess I didn't understand this as though I understand everything. But I didn't have half a handle on this that I got now. Because all my life, I was only interested in the sin unto and the sin not unto. And I don't really know what either one of them are. Is that crazy? That could cause us to miss the explanation that John offers. Listen to me carefully. John is going to speak here by the Holy Spirit of an intercessory kind of prayer. Now, it's, we are, the prayer is not taking the place of Jesus. It obviously goes through Jesus, who is our intercessor. I don't understand. I haven't understood most of my life, maybe till the last few weeks studying this, the amazing gift that God puts in our possession for a troubled brother or sister. If this gift <clears throat> that I can pray and intercede on my brother and God will give him life, if God, if that can be gained through prayer, surely a lesser gift would not be denied. And don't ask me about a lesser gift. I, after I wrote it, I thought it's dumb, but it, I had to have a contrast. John is discussing the prayer of a Christian who is concerned about a brother or sister. When a brother is sinning, what's in jeopardy? His whole life. His life now. His eternal life, it's all in jeopardy. <clears throat> it's like a, it should be this, this clang, you know, when we find a brother that we perceive to be in this, I mean, we should hear clang, 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 clang. Something should go off in our mind. It gets our attention. Did you see that? John is discussing the prayer of a Christian who's concerned about a brother. When any brother is sinning, I just did this. Okay, what will help? Well, gossip won't help. Talking about the problem that he has, unless I'm trying to find out, can you, I, I, I need some help with this. Will you, will you help me? I, I, I really genuinely love and, and concerned about this brother or sister. And <clears throat> so what will help? Well, the first stage is that thing called agape love. That demands intercession on God's behalf. Maybe I don't know what I can do. Maybe I can't, maybe I, I can't figure it out. But the one thing I can do is talk to God about the brother or sister. The prayer is bold because what are we asking? We're asking the brother <clears throat> that's sinning that could keep going down that path and be lost. We're asking for him life. We're not asking that we can give it. We can't give it, but Jesus can give it. If anyone sees his brother, it assumes that person is genuinely spiritual. You're not going around with a magnifying glass, you know, looking for warts on someone. We've all got our own sack of spiritual warts. 
But when we see someone engaged in something or you see someone troubled, we want to be spiritual as we handle it. John wants the any one of us or the we who prays to know Editi, that God indeed does hear prayer and that he answers what we ask of him. Stay with me. He prays knowing that God will give him life for one whose sin is not unto death. We'll look at the one unto death in a moment. Right now I'm concerned about the one that's not unto death. And by, by the way, never mind. The first sentence in this verse contains two nouns and five pronouns. We're going we're gonna to drop the, that and we're going to just put in some common names. So stay with me. If anyone, we're going to call this one Fred. If Fred sees his brother, we're going to call his brother Ricardo. If Fred sees Ricardo sending a sin, not unto death, he Fred shall ask, and he God will give him, Ricardo, life for him. Ricardo and others that like him, that's a sin not unto death. He said, well, Jerry, tell me all about it. I can't tell you a lot more, except I just know that I can pray. And if it's not a sin unto death, God goes, done deal. How does he do it? I don't know how God does most things. If Fred offered the prayer, Fred, Fred's the one who gets the answer. Right? Fred's asking. He gets the answer. The Greek literally translated, he will ask and will for him give life to him. I put God in brackets because God's the one who's going to give life. Ricardo did not even pray, not in this verse, he didn't. He may be, but not in the scenario that John is putting forth, he didn't pray. However, Ricardo receives life because Fred has prayed to God on his behalf. Is that good? Is that important? Yeah, it is. If it's, if it's me you're praying for, it is if it's you being prayed for, right? Listen to this. Jesus told a parable, a man had a fig tree <clears throat> planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it. But he didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, this caretaker, for three years now I've been coming to look for fig, on, fig trees on this tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it waste up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then I'll cut it down. Now, the caretaker of the vineyard begged a request on the petition of a life of a barren fig tree. John's example speaks of another caretaker of sort whose heart is inclined toward God. God, please, please give this brother or sister life. It's easy for me to think, well, maybe Fred's first action is to go see Ricardo. Maybe, maybe he can. Maybe he didn't know. Am I, am I hitting this? This thing's running around. Maybe he doesn't know what to do. Maybe he's, maybe he'll go talk to Ricardo after he's prayed. Are we afraid to talk to each other? You can nod your head. This, this one, you can nod your head. Sometimes we're, we find it challenging. When we're bold, when we're bold, God's goodness, how does that look? It's not a secret. And you can stomp me afterward, Larry, but Larry went at some point in time and got early Nellenbrot's husband. Just went over to his house and said, basically get in my pickup. You ever thought about becoming a Christian? Well, yeah, I thought, about, well, get in my pickup. Let's go get it done. If he hadn't done that, the man would have probably just gone to hell. Sometimes we need to do the... <clears throat> Stepping out of the box. Sometimes I need to get out here where <clears throat> it's not all understood and I don't have all my 
ducks in a row, but I'm going to trust that God will work through this and somehow this will get done. In the text, regard to sin is a sin not unto death. <clears throat> Though if sin places him in fellowship with God, he's in peril, but what? Sin unto death. So God gives him an extension of life. There's a real possibility if he keeps going where the way he's going, he's going to wind up spiritually dead, eternally lost. It might be that Ricardo's struggling with a habit. Doesn't matter what habit is. Could be overeating. My wife said, pull out your shirt and your belly won't stick out so much. I probably didn't pull it out enough, did I? Maybe a little more. We struggle with habits. They're all, it doesn't really matter. Anything that becomes my God that I worship and that I get through, what? All right. Jesus, John assures his readers that boldness in prayer is heard, answered, and valued by God. God may not answer the prayer the way I wanted it, but he wants to hear it. He wants to hear from you. Do you talk to God often? Now, <clears throat> I put this in here because it's, it goes without saying, Ricardo needs to repent. And, and maybe I'm the one to help him, or maybe there's brothers not, not gossiping or sisters getting together, and we can help this person come back to life. The phrase, a sin not unto death, <clears throat> reaffirms exactly what John started out in chapter 1. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies, continually purifies, purifies, purifies us from all sin. As we walk in the light. <clears throat> Maybe Ricardo is heading for darkness. Maybe he's getting over in the shadows. Can we, can we make judgments like that about people? Seems to me like there's a scripture that says, uh, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, you are spiritual, restore such a one with meekness and lest you be. So, so I think I can do that without being judgmental. If I can't, if you can't make any judgments about my life, how will you know when I jump into quicksand? Oh, he, he's struggling around over there. Look at him wiggle. It's like a worm. Really? 1 John 1, 7 and 9, the Christian walking in the light is therefore walking under the blood of Jesus and his sins do not break fellowship because he's not sin, the sin unto death. Here's the sin unto death. If one becomes impenitently bold and he stops walking in the light, he loses the constant cleansing of the blood. He says, I want nothing to do with Jesus. I could care less. That person, you're not going to pray for her. Now, you say, well, is it okay if I pray? Well, we'll go ahead. But think about this. John does, he doesn't necessarily prohibit it. Maybe he does. Maybe you read it your own way. Since there's no darkness in God at all, here's why. It's not proper to ask God to give life to one who's walking in darkness. God will not give life to a prodigal son who's still living in the pig pen. Right? If the prodigal son had still been in the pig pen, we wouldn't, we'd know the story. We wouldn't even know the story. The father would still be looking, and, and he'd still be in the pig pen. Jeremiah says this. God says to him, so do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with them, for I will not listen. Or do not pray for this people nor offer any plea or petition for them because I will not listen when they call me in their time of distress. The Lord Almighty who planted you has decreed disaster for you because the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done evil and provoked me to anger by burning incense to Baal. You remember the last thing before they said giddy up to head into the promised land in Deuteronomy. You remember the last thing he said? Stay away from foreign gods. In the context of Jeremiah, what's Israel's problem? 
in the context of Jeremiah, what is a problem? It's, it's a sin. It's always worked. Sin goes and looks for another God, right? Hello? Sin by nature. I said if I let Jerry do what Jerry wants, Jerry would just do whatever. <clears throat> it can be booze or drugs, burning incense, or it can be entertainment. I, I, I've been doing PT for my shoulder. By the way, it, it helps. But anyway, I've been doing PT for my shoulder, and this last week there was a young lady in there, and she was having to do something with one of her hands. But the hand that wasn't doing something, the other one was scrolling on the phone. I mean, I had a set up, stand up thing so I could just, uh, the whole 50 minutes, except when the lady tried to bring her back on board, hey, you're here for a reason. Oh, yeah, I'll start squeezing this thing again, just scrolling through her phone. Are you kidding me? There's nothing wrong with the phone. Unless you scroll on it all the time. Fame, beauty, sex, money, my comfort. Oh, I like my comforts. You like yours? Abortion. It's a minority. Minority in the world are screaming. <clears throat> Kill those babies. Kill them. Candace, someone who I sometimes follow, you know her, you don't know her, but she said 19 million black babies have been aborted. That's a lot. One is a lot. If you're not really convinced, I'm not, I'm going to wait out in the weeds knee deep here, but <clears throat> go online and check it out. You, you can watch them and when they take the suction device and they get over near that baby and they start trying to suck it apart, it starts, it starts trying to get away. When they take those McGill forceps and they reach in there and they snap the baby's back, it dies. And you'd think that that was the most important issue in the world. Power, instant gratification. The one that always gets my attention is how, as a nation, we're sacrificing our children. There's a lot of powerful people who are influencers. They make a living out of promoting ways to lead your children and your grandchildren away from God. All right, I'm about this knee deep in weeds, but let's keep going. You heard of birthing people? Now, men, these are birthing people, by the way. That's not just me, like a pot belly. That, that's supposed to be a pregnant man. And, and it says the Harvard Medical School tweeted this out, that not all who are women, not, that not all who give birth are women. Really? Really? You want to explain that one? I've got all day. Why would, it, so why would a society go here? Decadence. Decadence. And it's the, it's the desire of evil in the world to overcome good. Here's what God said. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And they took their children and they sacrificed and they were burnt alive to the God Moloch. I mean, sacrificing children, burning children is just unbelievable. But <clears throat> the command remains for you and me to not sacrifice our children and our grandchildren. They're gifts of God. They belong to God. And God will hold us accountable how we treat them. Now, I'm climbing out of the weeds. All right, I'm back down to my ankle. A false God makes no demands of righteousness. He didn't care about righteousness. What is the one thing a false God demands? Obedience. Just obey. Now, I want to end here. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that doesn't lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. What a marvelous gift. In all of Jerry's life, I've never done it. I was always interested in the who and the who not. By the way, 
You want to know about blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Come next week and I'll tell you about that. Take me about a minute or two, but if you don't come, you'll miss it. Sin is the deadliest of all things. What's happening in Ukraine and in places in Africa, nations that don't make the news, it's all tragic. But the greatest tragedy, tragedy is sin. The devil wants us. He wants our children. He wants our grandchildren. He's already got plans for your great, 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 great grandchildren. Don't worry about it. He's already figured it out. So you and I need to be strong. We need to be together. I am so glad to be here today with brothers and sisters of a like mind. I know I'm not the only one. I, I won't come with, with the Elijah syndrome. If you're here and you're not in Christ Jesus, you need to be baptized into Christ. If you understand what that is, if you don't, we, we wouldn't want to do it. But if you do, we'd help you become a child of God. If you need your life made right with God, if you want us to just pray for you about something. Let us know while we stand and sing. When the